Hi, I'm Leroy Hawkins. I'm Marina Scorciati. We're from Chicago, Chicago PD. PD. And you're watching In the Loop. On WYCC Channel 20. The following program is an original production of WYCC PBS Chicago. Chicago is ready for its close-up as a hub of film and television production. A growing number of directors are focused on shooting here in Illinois, bringing cash, notoriety, and jobs. Matchmaker, Matchmaker. How one program connects low-income students with Chicago's top companies. And Karen Lewis bows out of the race for Chicago mayor to deal with a health crisis. How will her departure impact the upcoming election? Stay with us for these stories and more tonight on In the Loop. Good evening, I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Chicago has rolled out the red carpet for television producers and filmmakers. In 2013, the city saw a 20% increase in movie and TV work over the year before. With tax breaks and other incentives, more projects are coming to town, bringing jobs and giving local actors a shot at stardom. Now, I need you to tell the cops what you know. But I don't. I've known you for years. Actress Patrice McLean thought she'd have to move to Hollywood to make it. Then Hollywood came to her. She landed a role in Chicago Fire, getting her big break at the same time her hometown did, too. I feel very blessed to be here at this time, you know, and I'm hoping that the wave continues. I hope it keeps going. For McLean and for the city where she was born and raised, this is a dream come true. Major film and TV productions have taken root in the Midwest, with a surge of projects now set in the Windy City. Producers weary of L.A. and New York are increasingly setting their sights here, with at least four series currently shooting around town. Chicago Fire and Chicago PD, which both air on NBC. We've got Empire, which is the new Terrence Howard show about a hip-hop dynasty. Sirens, which is a Dennis Leary project that is also shooting full time in town right now. We are awaiting Batman versus Superman to arrive in town. So it's really, really exciting. Filmmakers focus on Illinois for talent, scenery and savings, including tax credits and other incentives offered by the state. Betsy Steinberg is managing director for the Illinois Film Office. This has been the most exciting time for the Illinois film industry. We have seen a steady increase over the last several years, culminating in 2013's record-breaking numbers of $358 million poured into the local economy from direct film industry spending. Lake Michigan, the Chicago River, and Chicago's magnificent skyline have long been the backdrop for films and TV shows, but film buffs credit Jake and Elwood with the explosion of production here. The iconic 80s film Blues Brothers put Lower Wacker Drive and Chicago on the map. Since then, more than 1,100 feature films and television productions have shot in Chicago, a $2 billion boost to local revenue. Much of that production now takes place here at Cinespace, the old Ryerson Steel Warehouse on the city's west side, now transformed as the set for two hit NBC shows, Chicago PD and Chicago Fire. Michael Brandt is executive producer of both. When we first got here, there, there wasn't quite as much production going on. It kind of felt like a ghost town. And now um, there's certain days that both of our shows are shooting at the same time. I'll walk out the office door and walk towards the stages and I'll see 500 people working and trucks lined up. And I gotta say one of my proudest things as a producer on the show is seeing how many people get employed by the show because we're here. Monica Raymond plays paramedic Gabriella Dawson on Chicago Fire. I think it's so refreshing and so cool to be in this raw space that isn't used to having all these Hollywood shows come through. It's sort of learning as it goes and we're helping develop that. And really, I think it's exciting to be a part of that development for Chicago. Production is breathing new life into Rust Belt relics long abandoned. For location manager Nick Rafferty working on Chicago Fire, these silos on the city's near south side are golden. This is definitely iconic. Anytime you're on the 55, you pass these silos. These are old grain silos. They're at the crossroads of the river and the railroad tracks. 
and the city is perfectly situated behind them. Location is just one reason actor and director Bill Duke chose to set his new sitcom, Blexican, in Chicago. The city's history and culture also played a part. We're going to film everything in Chicago, and uh, because Chicago is one of the characters in the, in the series. The culture of Chicago, Hispanic culture, black culture, but the city itself. For Patrice McLean, Chicago was the backdrop to her childhood and now her future. She's acted in a number of productions here, Chicago Fire, USA Network show Sirens, and the short-lived ABC series Detroit 187. With success so close to home, she sees no reason to leave her family to follow her dream. Five years from now, I hope to be um, a regular on a network primetime television show. I want to be able to share successes with my mom. I want to show <sighs> I want to show her that um, that it was possible, you know, and that all her hard work raising me, raising my sister, that that paid off, you know, and that that my decision to follow my dream was the right one to make. Joining us now on set is Rich Moskal, director of the Chicago Film Office. Rich, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, last year was a record year for film production here in Illinois and in Chicago. How's this year shaping up? Uh, right on par. In fact, last year not only was a record year, but it was like twice as much in terms of revenue and job creation that came from film and television. And this year uh, we have just about as many television series shooting in town. And while we don't have the exact figures yet, it's looking to be a good year uh, right on par with what we did last year. Talk about the revenue and those jobs. How much income is created in Illinois? How many jobs created here? Well, from film and television production into a certain portion of commercial production last year was $358 million in terms of local spending. And that's not $358 million to Hollywood actors and producers. That's $358 million to hiring local technicians, local actors, local tradespeople. Um, and the jobs that came from that were totaled about 4,400. So it's a significant chunk of business. And while it has that perception and it has that personality of being Hollywood and being from out of town. It's very much a local business like any other business that hires Chicagoans to do good work. That's what the film industry is for Chicago right now. It's it's good business. Let's talk about that because Chicago also in return gives film incentives of about 30 percent to movie makers and TV producers when they come to town. What does that look like? How does that work? Well, it's very competitive, for one. The reason why the state offers an incentive is because there's 40 other states throughout the country also offering incentives and in countries around the world. Canada was the first, actually, to start offering incentives. So the competition for trying to attract the industry and retain the industry is fierce. It's never been more competitive than it is now. What Chicago offers on top of that incentive is extraordinary production value. The look of the city is undeniably good and producers fall in love with it the second they get here. The quality of the talent that resides here so that producers don't have to bring actors with them, they don't have to bring crew with them, they don't have to bring in their equipment. It's all here, which is also a big part of our selling point. We're not just a destination, we truly are a hub these days. So in offering an incentive, we're really just sort of sweetening what is already a very attractive package for producers. but. The state's incentive is, um, is very competitive with what other states offer. There are other, other states that offer a lot more in the way of money, but I think what has kept the Illinois incentive so strong is that it's fiscally responsible. It doesn't give the store away. It sort of matches the industry at a level where the industry takes notice. When you look at this and the incentives we give, uh, Illinois clearly is a state in financial trouble. Can the state afford to give tax breaks to Hollywood? Well, once again, it's, it's about balance. And uh, in attracting a business, you have to take into account what the competition is. And if we didn't offer an incentive of any kind, we really wouldn't have it. We're not for the incentive. There really wouldn't be an industry here. Um, it's sort of the state of the industry where it is now. But once again, the state only incentivizes the hiring of local people and local vendors and local resources. There are some states that actually incentivize out of state, whereas the Illinois incentive is all about creating jobs for Chicagoans and for, for Illinois residents.
Yeah, when you look at the news, some states have scaled back their film incentives, saying that basically taxpayers aren't getting what they paid for. Michigan, in particular, which had a huge incentive, like blew everybody out of the water in terms of incentives. They realized that they were giving too much away for not enough return, and part because in Michigan did not have the industry infrastructure to support it. They were flying in all their actors and their crew from out of town. All the equipment was being trucked in. Here in Chicago, uh, to our benefit, obviously, is the fact that all of this, all of those ingredients, all of those pieces of the pie already exist here. All right. You have a very interesting job. You have to call City Hall and say, can you close the street so we can blow stuff up? <laughs> <laughs> How tough is that? It's, it's a challenge, but it's fun. I mean, the logistics behind it. One of the other things that Chicago can offer is tremendous customer service. I mean, we, we really do take into account the complicated logistics and the schedules that productions provide us, which are always brief and they're always extraordinary. And the types of things that they do are not every day. Crashing planes onto Lakeshore Drive or blowing things up that don't really blow up but are made to look like they blow up. Um, you, you have to keep an open mind. And part of my job and part of the city's response is to be mindful of the fact that the industry does extraordinary things and it, it has to be matched by an extraordinary level of service. And we take great pride in that. And the, and the industry responds to it. They, they like the fact that Chicago knows what it's doing when it comes to this stuff. Clearly, some of this is about bragging rights. I know I never get tired of seeing our beautiful city skyline on oh, the big screen totally, or on television. Yeah. But um, talk about what's in the pipeline. What can we expect? What's, who's coming to town in the next uh, Well, the next really big project uh, is um, uh, Superman versus Batman, although they're not necessarily calling it that right at the moment, but it's the sequel to Superman, Man of Steel, which also shot here in Chicago a couple of years ago. This is now, if you're a comic book geek, it, this is, it doesn't get any bigger than this, right? It's like the two most superheroes. Super, superest of superheroes, right? <laughs> sort of like battling out in Metropolis and Chicago stands in for Metropolis. That's terrific. Well, we'll stay tuned for Superman versus Batman. Rich Moskal, thank you so much for joining us. Now here's Chris with a look at other stories trending this week. Thanks, Barbara. Can Ebola hit Chicago? One expert says yes, and Karen Lewis bows out of the race for Chicago mayor. Now joining us today to discuss these topics and more are Pedro de Jesus, executive vice president for Tampico Beverages. Doug O'Brien, public affairs consultant for Prairie State Strategies, and Hope Daniels, associate professor of media arts at Columbia College. Hello, everybody, Hi. And, and welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. The head of the communicable disease control for Cook County now says it is, quote, very likely that the Ebola virus will reach Chicago. Pedro, what is your level of confidence that the Chicago area is ready for Ebola? Not, not high. I mean, the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, how did two nurses who were trained and had all the protective gear still managed to get infected? And how did the CDC, who knew that there was somebody who was working with Ebola patients and, and, and was a nurse who had a low-grade fever, how did they allow her to get on a plane from Dallas to Cleveland? It doesn't give me a lot of confidence that we're completely prepared and that we're ready to deal with this. Doug, any lessons from that, from what happened in Texas? Well, a couple of things, and, and I, I served in, at the Department of Health and Human Services, and, and one thing people need to know is that there is a tremendous amount of work that goes in year in and year out to pandemic and infectious disease preparedness. But there's always going to be, there are always going to be unique circumstances. I think in this situation, we clearly see that there were some lapses in following protocols. Uh, there really wasn't, uh, I don't think, enough of a direct hands-on response in Dallas in terms of imposing those protocols and ensuring that they were followed. Whether or not the disease is going gonna, is gonna to spread throughout the country, I think, is, I think it's still far too early to, to raise alarm bells. But I think there are some very simple things the public can do to be cautious. But I really think that public health agencies have got to step up their game. I hope here in Chicago now, beginning today uh, at the airport, People were screened if they were coming from three West African countries, uh, screened for fevers. But is that enough, just screening people from those three countries? Not nearly enough. And it's going to affect passengers traveling all over the world coming through Chicago. The National Institute for Health, Institutes for Health actually gave $3 million to a corporation to develop a quick modality to see if people have Ebola and think home pregnancy test to figure out if it's going to happen. So it's going to slow down the lines, it's going to create more cost, and we have to go through it. And what can Chicago do specifically, even though we haven't had any uh, cases here? What are your thoughts about that? Not if, but when. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Alderman uh, Burke and Alderman Zaluski uh, at last city council meeting, they had proposed an ordinance 
uh, that, uh, pr that proposed a more comprehensive screening, not only at O'Hare, but at Midway Airport, uh, that involved not only just uh, Ebola, but uh, uh, several other diseases, several other uh, infectious diseases as well. Uh, and when the mayor heard of this, he didn't quite know how to handle it. Uh, it said something to the effect of, well, we're not really ready to take that step. And the Department of Public Health came out and said they thought it was overkill. Uh, but considering what, what's going on and considering that, uh, that it, it, we're having a hard time containing this, it wouldn't be maybe a bad idea. And, of course, now we know that this nurse flew from Dallas to Cleveland and back. She didn't know she was infected, but she had been treating uh, an infected patient who later died. And I, she called the CDC mm -hmm, to see right. if it was okay for her to fly, and they said, oh, 99.4 temperature, go ahead and fly. The variable was that she was yeah. treating that patient. Well, I, I think that we, there's a middle ground we have to look for here because before we have aldermen proposing new ordinances, frankly, whether it's the city council, the state legislature, even Congress, uh, that is not necessarily the hotbed of great public health policy. We need to be looking to step up the enforcement of protocols with a very robust public health infrastructure that we already have. There are lapses in following the existing protocols. That's really, and that's the easiest way to contain this. We don't have to layer on more and more hysterics and more and more people posing for, for, for pictures but and don't, having don't press conferences. Don't you think they're doing protocols as they go along? They're no. learning by their missteps? Well, there, no, not really, because hospitals, obviously there were, there were a lot of missteps in, in Dallas, but hospitals are, uh, they're drilling on pandemic and infectious disease preparedness on a regular basis in conjunction with state, local health departments, with CDC and HHS. We've been doing it here in the city of Chicago for years, Although working the with C the hospitals. Although the CDC just this week um, completely revamped um, its whole protocol right. for healthcare workers. So there's a lot of uh, new uh, information just coming out. Steep learning curve. Steep learning. Uh, on that note, we have to, to switch a little bit from health to politics. We're only three weeks, less than three weeks away from, three weeks away from a, a big, important election here. In their second debate, Governor uh, Quinn and Bruce Rauner were talking really about issues especially affecting the um, African-American community. And Hope, let me ask you, can Rauner convince enough African-Americans to pull out a, a victory statewide? <laughs> he brought Harold Washington back from the grave <laughs> to talk about Quinn. That's one time. <laughs> <laughs> I think the point is jobs, economic development, and he's proven through his company that he can do that, but I've been reading that he, a lot of the companies, the lot of positions were outsourced. So what does that mean for people who need jobs here in Illinois? Doug, traditionally, a candidate has to win 20% of Cook County, a Republican, in order to win statewide, and that means uh, African-American and Latino voters. Can Rauner do that? Yeah. I've seen a number of the, the models that have been put together in terms of turnout projections and vote totals. Uh, it, it is a very, very close race. I think, I think Bruce Rauner is in a great position right now, and he's also had the resources, which have been lacking in some past, for some past Republican candidates, to have the ground game to turn out the vote and also to go into some non-traditional uh, communities and, and ask for votes. That's, that's always the key component. And Bruce has been, he's, every Sunday he's in African American churches, be it in Chicago or in other communities around the state. Now, the question is, how much will it impact the ballot box? But if you think about it, you only, a, a Republican candidate only has to peel away two or three or four percent of the African American vote. In order, to, in order to be in a very strong position to win statewide. We've seen just this week that Rauner has gotten endorsements from both the Chicago Tribune and Crane Chicago Business. But then on Sunday, uh, Pedro, President Obama is coming in here to Chicago, Chicago State, for a giant rally for Quinn. Do these endorsements and the backing of the president, do they make a big difference in a statewide race? Like I, I think it helps. Um, you know, the, the Crane's endorsement wasn't surprising because they're a business publication, and I, I, I think you could argue that the Tribune endorsement wasn't, wasn't unexpected either. But, you know, the, the problem that Quinn has with these endorsements that he's going to face in the, in, in the ballot box in November is that you know, a vote for Quinn or an endorsement for Quinn is really a vote for the status quo. And the status quo in Illinois it's pretty bad, right? So you have to ask yourself, if you're a voter, if, if you're looking for change, who's the best change agent? And if you look at these endorsements, they concluded, even though Rauner didn't give them all the specifics they were looking for uh, in, 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 uh, in, his, in his future plans, they really thought that he was the one person that would be in, in the best position to make a change in Illinois. And I don't think, I don't think Quinn really has, ca has captured that as part of his campaign yet. One, one element here that's interesting, the president coming in, it, it, it obviously helped Quinn four years ago, 
But again, right now, when you look at the president's popularity numbers, they're different than what they were four years ago. Although in Illinois, they're still pretty good. They're still pretty, pretty good, good, but they're nowhere near where they were four years ago. But also the closing argument, and especially in this race, is about independent voters. Uh, and this is turning tur Quinn turning back to rally the base, which is important. But again, we're talking about a president who's much less popular among independents, whereas when you look at the Tribune, Cranes, almost every newspaper around the state But he's still endorsing popular with Rauner. minorities and women. But we're still, again, we're talking about the base. And when we're talking about an election that's going to be decided by independents, now, Quinn needs to rally his base. His base is soft. The enthusiasm level is lower mm -hmm. among Democrats. We've seen that. Off-year elections, you have lower turnout in the African-American and Hispanic communities. So all those things play against Quinn, which is why he needs to rally that base. But how much is that going to impact independent voters? Probably a lot less than it did for you. We have ago. another big election coming up, this one in February, the mayoral election. And this week, of course, we heard that Karen Lewis, the president mm -hmm. of the teachers' union, had a very unfortunate health crisis. She is battling a brain tumor. And Hope, where does this leave Mayor Emanuel now? Uh, with a few months before the election. Looking pretty good. <laughs> There's a very short list of people who could actually come out and make this a viable, interesting campaign. And I've been thinking Tom Tunney, 44th Ward, he took on the Ricketts in Wrigley Field. Not always successful, but he took them on. He's got money. He's got name recognition up there with Ann Sathers. He could step into this race and make it interesting. Then, of course, there's another alderman, uh, Fioretti, who has uh, already joined. But does he have the, 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 either the name recognition um, or the money, Pedro, to compete with Rahm Emanuel right. on a $9 million, million dollars. Dollars. I mean, He's raised $325,000, but he, it, the problem is, is bigger than that. Karen Lewis was a very particular personality. She had a certain charisma to her. She wasn't afraid to take on the mayor on the tough issues, and she really invigorated the progressive movement. I think her exit of the race really puts a big blow to the progressive movement because there's very few people that are going to be able to, to pick up that momentum, and I don't really think Fioretti is going to be able to do it. Yeah. Doug, Mayor Emanuel said uh, this week that he is still going to have debates uh, even though uh, the, the potentially most difficult candidate um, has, has now decided not to run. Will those debates help the underdog or help Rom? Uh, you know, frankly, when you look at the difference in resources, I, I think obviously Rom's in a great position. All of us, are, our, our thoughts are with Karen Lewis because while I certainly don't agree with her on many issues, she's a passionate, uh, a passionate advocate for her causes. And I think everybody, Chicago, suburbs, statewide, are going to be... Uh, they will lose out on having a really, really spirited debate and discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think it had the potential to make, uh, even though Rahm is in, is in the catbird seat here, it, it, it stood to make him a better mayor and a better candidate. And I think we're all going to miss out on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hope, your thought on that? I think that Rom is going to get better as time goes on. I think public opinion is going to push him to become a much better mayor, and he loves being mayor in Chicago. His public opinion polls um, have really dropped, especially mm -hmm. in the wake of the, the school closings, which has been a, a lingering issue. It wasn't a one-week or one, two-week news right. story. He needs to pay attention to that. And uh, the budget for Chicago, the mayor was just mm. released uh, this week, some um, interesting things, new taxes on parking uh, at hotels, valet parking, new taxes on parking uh, at O'Hare. The trade-off, I guess, is more money going to things like uh, pothole repair. <laughs> and Pedro, how about this balance here in the budget? You know, he has got a tough challenge on his hands. You know, there's a nearly $300 million budget gap that he's trying to fill, and he wants to do it without raising property taxes because this is really an election year budget. Uh, so he's trying to find these creative ways, such as raising uh, the parking tax, uh, and of course he has to address the pothole issue if you drive through the city of Chicago anywhere um, and you, you know through after the last winter's aftermath that uh, uh, you, know, you, you hit one wrong hole and, and <laughs> your you're, car gonna, dies. You're, you're in the shop, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so he wants to double the number of crews of potholes because he realizes that that's going to be a liability for him moving forward uh, but you know he didn't really address the big issue, the elephant in the room. Which it is, is the, the elephant in the room, right, which, which is, is? The pension crisis. Pension mm -hmm. crisis, mm -hmm. right? Well, Chicago owes a half, half a billion dollars to the, the police and fire pension. It, it is not. We, we see this also playing out on the gubernatorial scale. It's not surprising that, that the mayor wants to put off till after the election saying what he's actually going to do about taxes. It's the same thing that Governor Quinn is doing right now, too. But what's interesting, and I think was wise, is that the mayor looked at taxes that could also be termed as user fees because people who are driving into the city, parking downtown, who commute from outside of the city, 
should be paying more to upkeep the infrastructure that they use every day. That's more, that's more understandable, whereas property taxes are incredibly regressive and tend to hurt lower income and senior citizens in the neighborhoods a lot more than they do uh, people who are commuting to their jobs in the loop. So I think he's trying to strike a good balance, but the chickens are going to come home to roost after this election on the on the pension obligations. It's going oh, to on, that, on that cautionary note, I'm sorry, we are uh, oh. running out of time. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks to our guests, Pedro de Jesus, Doug O'Brien, and Hope Daniels. You may have heard about the digital divide between the tech savvy and those of us who lack such skills, but here in Chicago, a group called Year Up tackles the opportunity divide, giving young people who lack money and education a helping hand on their way to meaningful careers. My name is Daniel, and um, I'm the field tech intern here at U.S. Resources. Um, it's an awesome job or internship so far. This might look like a science fiction movie set, but for 19-year-old Europe student Daniel Navarrete, it's a fantasy realized. He came here from Mexico, got his high school diploma and work authorization, but could not find a job because he lacked the relevant experience. Then he found Year Up. For Navarrete, the stuff of science fiction is closer to becoming fact. Yeah, I want to be an engineer. I definitely want to build stuff. I want to, I just want to make a difference in the world. The organization estimates six million young adults in the country don't have access to the education and training they need. By its estimate, 14 million jobs will go unfulfilled in the next decade. Europe tries to close the opportunity divide. Our belief is that in our city we have a number of young adults who are out of school and out of work without a meaningful path to either. And so we specifically target young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 who've recently graduated or have a GED. So Europe provides a bridge for those who need help getting to college and finding good jobs. While in the program, students can earn up to 18 hours of college credit uh, in partnership with City Colleges of Chicago. In addition to that, they have meaningful internships at corporations all throughout our city, folks like J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citadel, Aon, Google, Accenture. These organizations ultimately convert them into full-time hires. Students such as Daniel Navarrete have been able to turn childhood passions into pathways for careers. I've always liked tech when I was little. Uh, there was this computer magazine called Alienware, and they would send it to my house every day, and I would grab this book, and I'd look at these really nice computers. This program, founded in Boston, now has more than a dozen sites across the country. The Chicago one opened four years ago. Every student who joins the program gets the support of education. They get the opportunity to earn college credits. They are here participating for six full months, gaining those skills in information technology, as well as skills in business communication and professionalism, or the soft skills that are needed for work. After that training, students such as Daniel spend six months working in a Chicago company, polishing the skills they've learned. A lot of people put themselves down, but, or they don't know where they're heading in their life, and every choice you make has a consequence. And I think this is a great result of what I got. That does it for this week's show. To hear more from the cast of Chicago Fire and Chicago PD and what they have to say about working in Chicago, log on to our website and look for In the Loop. Until next time, I'm Chris Beard. And I'm Barbara Pinto. Good night. Good night.